And when we started the beginning of the year, I would have said that. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Rapid Fire Golf, episode 36, I think we said. Uh, back inside at the Bethlehem Golf Club. We got a little bit of rain in the background. Um, so we're back inside, sort of back in the office studio room. Um, so yeah, hope all is well. Um, if, if you guys haven't been here before, as normal, um, rapid fire golf, you post up or uh, yeah, post up your questions. I will answer them semi rapidly. Uh, if you've been here before, you know the deal. You post up your questions whenever you'd like, and we will uh, chat all things golf. Golf's getting a little dirty, and uh, you fire when ready, and I'll uh, I'll be ready to rock and roll. Based on those swings that I saw today, I gotta keep that uh, little you know practice. A eh? And keep my side. But so as soon as I see some questions pop up, guys, we'll uh, we'll chat. Feels good. I'll push cut. The best part about the live is I can actually see myself as I'm doing my back swing pieces. Okay. Uh, okay, Robbie. Uh, what do you think of golf grip training aids? Uh, I like them. I mean, I've only ever used like two or three of them. I know one of the weighted clubs we have over that we used to use for the beginner uh, clinics had the actual like indentations in the grip for you to put your um, hands into. I think for someone who's first starting, that that's a uh, that's a that's a great way to go about it, especially in the beginning. And, and changing your grip can feel so goofy. Um, right. So, A, I think for a beginner to be able to have firmly, hey, put your fingers on, especially the little crevices for your thumbs to go. And then, B, when you're making a change, to actually feel where your hands exactly should go. Um, I like them. I think that's, I think that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's cool. We just did a video today on grip. Uh, we haven't done a YouTube video on grip. We have some stuff on the membership site, but for of all the 600 videos we've done, we haven't done just a general grip video. So, we did one today that'll come out in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, Jeffrey, how to get more club head speed? So there's a lot of ways. I think there's two big picture ways to get more club head speed. Number one, improve your swing mechanics. Um, so put something in terms of your swing mechanics, I'll get you more speed. Number two is train your body to move faster. So you can take whatever mechanics you have, train your body to produce more speed. That can create more speed, meaning like explosiveness, gym stuff, squats, things like that. Or you can uh, improve your swing mechanics. If you're gonna go swing mechanics route and you're currently lacking speed, you gotta look at the macro things first and then the micro things second. Macro things to improve your speed would include first and foremost, turn. So do you have a big enough turn on the way back of your torso and shoulders in particular? And then during the downswing, it would be turn in terms of basically pelvis and rib cage. So increasing your body's amount that you turn during the back swing would improve speed or increase speed and or improving the amount you rotate on the way down. That would be the biggest macro thing. The second macro thing would be pressure in your feet. And so how I use the ground, ideally I wanna push off my lead foot a little bit. If you saw that Kyle long drive, dude, he'd kind of step, rock, step. A uh, little mini version of that. Um, if you look at a pressure mat, you'll see um, guys with a lot of speed actually press, in, press into their lead foot first and then unweight the lead foot into the trail foot, reweight the lead foot in early transition and then push up and out of that. So I would say you would wanna maximize the body turns first, number one, and then you would wanna look at the pressure in the feet. And then there's other pieces, right? Like having said all that, if your club face is open ever, you're not gonna lose a lot of speed because you gotta square that up late, right? So having your club face square to close is a big one. Um, you might wanna learn how to lower the dynamic loft and you don't need as much speed. You can still hit it farther. You can look at where the shaft is at in space. I mean, for more speed, Typically, we're going to see a shaft that's more towards vertical and then more, more towards under. Can you hit it far if you go in and over? Yeah, of course. Um, but typically, a more vertical shaft will produce more speed. Um, you can look at things like how long your backswing is, internal, external, trail shoulder. I mean, there's a lot of mechanical options, uh, Jeffrey. I would say maybe best to work with a coach, see what your swing, um, where there's gaps. But that would be the, the macro and the micro. Uh, Adam, what do you think of Roy Macro using the Tour Striker Plane Mate, perhaps the best training aid for a long time? Yeah, so I think number one, I don't know that, you know, so A, I love Martin Chuck. I don't know David Woods, I think is his partner on. I've never met him before or talked with him. Seems like a cool dude. Uh, we love Martin Chuck, really good guy, really good products, love Tour Striker, it's all cool. Yeah, I think if you see a video, I saw the little thing of Roy hitting it today. There's a difference between 
someone trying a training aid and like doing a video for someone and like actually using it. Now I know Rory does use the ball. He has seen him many times use the ball between his arms, the tour striker ball. And so if he uses the playmate moving forward, that's, that's beautiful. I love it. Good for Martin Chuck. We have a, we have one literally right behind me. Um, I've used it like twice inside. We're going to, I'll use it a little more and then we'll, I'm planning on meeting up with Martin Chuck this winter and doing some, doing some stuff together. So I'm sure we'll use it a little more then. Um, but yeah, if he, if he used that, I, I think it's cool. I like it. I like it. I like any aids that help the uh, the feedback process. Ultimately, video is king of the hill, but um, you can use the aids like the impact snap we do with Marta. Some aids that are really, really good. Uh, Ken, can you talk about loading into the right foot slash side during the backswing, the feelings that should come with a loaded backswing? So during your backswing motion from face on, there should be a pressure shift into the trail side. So if I start, let's just keep things simple and assume I'm 50-50 in my legs or in my feet. Um, a lot of players, again, will have a little bit of a push into the left before they push back. But from here, as I go during my backswing, there'll be an increase in the pressure underneath my trail foot as I go. There's going to be a combination during the backswing of a turning of my pelvis, a tilting of my pelvis in, in this direction. So there'll be a little bit of sway, a little bit of tilt with my left hip lower as I'm turning to get back up to the top. Now, if you do that all correctly and your, your right hip turns up and back as you make your backswing, you should probably feel a little bit of pressure, um, a little bit of glute activation, if you will, on the way back pressure more towards the middle or back part of the heel. So the pressure is working away from my body. Now, not a lot of mass. There's typically going to be a little sway, but you're swaying as you're turning. So your hip still stays inside the line. So the hip goes up and back. The left hip goes down and in. A little bit of pressure shift into the right. Um, you should feel that back into your right hip and right glute. Pressure should be in the middle part to the heel of the right foot. That would be kind of a general overview there, Ken. Does any particular grip make it easier to get a flat left wrist at the top? Yes, a weaker grip would be easier to have a flat left wrist. So the weaker your grip is, uh, the more counterclockwise your left hand is on the grip, the easier it is to have a flat left wrist. Now the kicker is, because you have a weak grip, you have to have a flat left wrist to get the face square. So if you have a weak grip and a cupped left wrist, the face is open at the top. You see that how it hangs? Now, if you've got a stronger grip and a cup left wrist, the face is still square at the top. So a weaker grip with your lead hand will be easier to have flat, but then you must have it flat at the top. And in all likelihood, as you work down an impact, you can't do as much of a drive hold, kind of elbow towards the target. You're going to have to add a little bit more supination, a little bit more supination to square that. Um, I have a hard time not cupping my wrist at the top and have a neutral grip currently. Yeah, weaker grip would make it easier to do that. You also could play around with, are you feeling it with your left hand? Maybe you got to feel it with your right hand. So bend your trail hand back more. Could be another different option. Um, if you watch our grip and wrist conditions videos and some of the, the trail or right hand videos or right wrist videos on the way back can help with that. We did another video on that today. Um, but yeah, that's um, weaker grip would help, but then you must do it. Coming too much from inside, should I change my backswing or should I try to rotate more through my through swing, I'm young and flexible. Yeah, so if you, I'm assuming you mean you, uh, you're saying you're coming too far inside on the way uh, down during the downswing. So if you're too far under plane, right? If this is sort of a plane you swing on, let's say you took this normal setup position and you put this kind of right at the same angle of the club, I'm assuming what you're saying is you're too far under plane or from inside here early. Um, now, if you're too under plane, then you must rotate your body a lot um, to be able to get the club back on plane. So it'll sort of tip the shaft at the end, a la like a Sergio Garcia. So yes, you can add more rotation. Now you might also need to literally get the club back in front of you, right? So one of the drills you would do for that, if you search my name and cure your hook, um, you'll see this drill in there. It's one that we use if you're two under plane, where you would put the stick behind you through the bucket, take your normal setup position, and get the club kind of right down your toe line and put the stick just underneath that. So I would go something like this. So I'd go there, I put the stick right about there. And then you, and you would learn how to hit some shots where you get this kind of back on top of the plane. And when you do this, you'd be hitting kind of little fade shots just to get started, just to get a feel of getting the club back on top of the plane. Um, you can do that and rotate. Uh, yeah, if you're too far under plane, you're going to have some contact issues, usually fats and thins and pushes and hooks. So I would maybe do both of them. If you can just rotate your body and that matches up, that's cool. If not, you might have to add something like that in there. What causes a shank? 
Yeah, it could be several things. Um, there's not one cause of a shank. There could be um, a bunch of them. It could be setup related, right? So at my address position, because we know everything's equal and opposite, if I start with my pressure either too far on my toes or too far on my heels, I'm gonna have some different bends going on with that. But either way, I'm gonna have to compensate. So let's say, for example, I start with my weight too far back on my heels, uh, maybe a little close to the ball. If I'm back on my heels at a dress, either during the backswing or the downswing, I'm gonna start working forward towards my toes. If I work forward towards my toes, that means my club's gonna be too far outside of the ball. That could be a shank. I could also shank the ball because I'm too far under plane. If I get too deep with my lead arm, too far around, too deep again when I come back down this way, and my swing direction gets too far to the right, I could shank because of that. I could be too over plane and hit a shank. I've seen that as well um, before if there's a swing plane issue. So I would say in general, it's either a balance in your feet issue, a posture issue that you're making up for later, or a swing plane issue. Now that doesn't really narrow it down for you. I mean, at the end of the day, really, I think it was Elias, or no, that was uh, the next person. So I would have to see your swing, certainly to say for sure, um, but it could be any of those. Now, the quick fix little thing you would do is put the object outside of the ball, right? If you search my name and shank, we did a video that kind of explains some of these pieces. We would put an object outside of the ball, something like this, depending upon what your issue is, give yourself just a little bit of room and really make sure in the follow through, you feel like you rip the grip and your hands up and left. So if normally you have a shank and the club comes out this way, you wouldn't feel like you rip the grip up and to the left. And um, it maybe even feel like you're hitting off the toe a little bit in the beginning with some half arms. That would be a drill to start with. Now, of course, like those drills, that can work. Um, but if you have something in terms of your setup that's off, that's causing it, you got to fix the root cause. So I'd have to see your swing. As per all you guys, coronagolf.com is where you can go to post your swing where I can work with you because um, this could be some kind of root issue earlier on. Um, what do you think of biomechanics, measuring your arm width, forms, et cetera? I think biomechanics are um, good to study and measure. Coffee break. Um, but I don't know that I, that I think measurements necessarily need to dictate a swing pattern. So there's some um, different philosophies out there that say like, hey, based on your height or your arm length or your forearm length or whatever, that you should swing a club a certain way. And, may, and maybe that's true and I just don't know enough about it and I need to just study it more and it does match up. I've just seen so many players hit certain checkpoints and create certain motions and have fixed so many players and I've never once measured someone's forearm to wrist ever in my whole life. I've never once measured how tall specifically someone was or what their wingspan was or whatever. Now, maybe I should, you know, maybe could I help them faster? Maybe I could buy that there could be something like that. Um, but I would just have a hard time seeing the amount of success we've had without ever doing something. And then someone saying that that's like the most important thing you should base everything off of. Again, I'm willing to change my mind, but I think biomechanics and the general idea of how the body works and some scientific like um, principles where it's not just bro science is probably good. Um, I just don't know about the specifics of some of the things, but I'm willing to, I'd be willing to change my mind on that and be proven otherwise. Uh, Jeffrey, you are welcome, my friend. Uh, oops, I got a pair. Uh, Jim, what's going on, buddy? My backswing, my arms are very low flat. How can I get my hands over my head without losing any depth? Yeah, so you can't do that, right? So like inherently, those are two different things. If you're too low and you want to go more vertical, you will lose some depth, right? That's like, how do I lose weight and gain weight at the same time? Not possible, right? You're either going to lose weight or gain weight or stay the same. In terms of backswing depth, you're either going to stay the same or lose depth or get more depth. And so uh, just to kind of clarify that, you, you, I wouldn't be worried about both of those. I think if you're too low with your lead arm here and you want to get on your shoulder plane, you need to get it uh, up more, hey -o, and just do it at the right times, right? So like from takeaway, really, if I go from here and I do the takeaway and the club heads, even with my hands, when it, the club is right down my toe line, that should be where you are here. From here to the top, you want your hands to go through your pec and bicep is your second checkpoint. So your left arm's not straight down the line. It's not in 100 degrees. It's in line with your right pec, right bicep. And then from there, it keeps working up as it works into the top. That would be an ideal backswing. If you go here and then you go too far in, you need to feel like you go here and go up until you go through that pec and bicep. Now, if you go too far up, 
then you've overdone that. You can't feel as far. You got to find a middle. So it's really all about recording yourself, Jim, from down the line. Ideally, you have a live view um, so you can actually watch yourself as you're doing it. That would be ideal. There's 87 people on here right now. Ideally, 87 of us, every single time we practice, should have a live view or something you can see yourself live. That would be the best way to practice. Now, the fact that not all 80 or 90 of us have it either means we're lazy or we don't want to spend the money to, to do it or we don't really care enough about changing our swing. That would be the best way to do it. No ifs, ands, what's about it. So, Jim, imagine you made a backswing. You literally could see yourself and you say, hey, is this the right feel? Well, if I have a checkpoint, hey, my hands need to be in line with my pec. Well, if your hands are in line with your pec, then that is the right thing. Whatever you feel to do that is the right deal. That's the whole thing. We should really all have live views. That's the, um, that's the real answer. Coupon code for that's EC Golf, by the way, if you want to save some money on there. I think it's EC Golf. EC Golf. Mary put it in the link. We should all have live views. That's not even the sales. That's legitimate. We should all have live views. Um, let's see. Can you explain turning the shoulders versus the torso? I know the left shoulder needs to go down. Is that a complete shoulder turn when starting the takeaway? Which one is more accurate and powerful? So when you do a backswing, I think separating torso turn versus shoulder turn is kind of something that doesn't do much benefit, meaning you should just think that your whole body turns. Think of turning and a torso and shoulders kind of as one unit. Now there's also going to be a tilt, which you're referencing during the backswing. So a left side bend or whatever we want to call it, my left shoulder getting closer to my hip, my uh, left side of my hip without my trail hip moving. So I don't want to go this way. It's just a little bit of a side bend, a little left side crunch. So as I'm turning, I'm trying to get back to about a 90 degree turn, ideally, or more. I'm going to also be side bending, okay? And I'm doing that more or less right off the bat. When I take my normal setup position, if you can see me from my backside, you get a little butt view there, it's for free. You're gonna see my bottom part of my spine's pretty straight, and then the top part of it rounds, right? So it's not like my whole spine rounds. The bottom part's pretty straight, and then as I add side bend in, the top part rounds. That'd be my setup. Can you see that okay? Now from here, by the time I get to, so I have some right side bend. By the time I get to my takeaway, my spine is more or less straight now. So I've gone, okay, let's see if you guys are paying attention here. At address, I've got right side bend. By the time I get to my takeaway position, I've lost that side bend. I'm now straight up and down. From there to the top, I'm now going more into left side bend, gradually from the top. Can we write this down as a video? Uh, let's just put, um, Right side bend to left side bend. So I'm losing my left side bend. I'm straight by the time I'm here, straight up and down. Now I'm going even more into left side bend. So you're kind of doing it the whole way to answer your question. You're turning gradually from zero to 90 in kind of 30 increments. So 30 degrees of turn, 60 degrees of turn, 90 or, or more degrees of turn. And your left side bending, uh, put your left shoulder down kind of the whole time. Hopefully that answers your question there. Uh, Lawrence, when do you start the shoulder tilt slash turn in the backswing? Conveniently, I just answered two for one there as a little bonus. So same answer. Uh, Kevin, I can't stop my hands from rolling over in my backswing. If I try to compensate, I get steep. What can I do to feel my hands working properly? So Kevin, I would start with, we have like five or six, maybe seven takeaway videos on here. So whatever I'm going to tell you in the next 30 to 60 seconds, um, if you watch this, those go much more in depth. If you roll your hands or whatever you do in your swing, always you've got to do the opposite. Whether we're talking about rolling the hands, getting too far inside, getting vertical, up, down, sideways, whatever the issue is, too far on your toes, heels, whatever, you've got to feel the opposite, right? So we've identified your problem, which is step one. Let's say you've got too much forearm rotation, which is uh, during your backswing, you, uh, your hands and arms, let's say, turn clockwise. Let's assume that's correct. And you want to get rid of that. What do you need to feel? Well, you don't go from forearm rotation to just straight, you go from forearm rotation to counter rotation. You have to feel the opposite to that. Just like if someone hits a slice, you don't go from slice to straight, you need to go from slice to hook. If you, you need to go from too much forearm rotation to counter rotation. That's like actually literally your arms, your hands, you put them in front of you, turning the wheel to the left. Like I'm making a left hand turn and so I'm actually counter rotating my forearms, which is gonna look like this on the way back. Now, you're not actually gonna do that. If you're here and you feel counter, you'll probably be perfect, which is the point. And then if you're saying you're steep from there on the way down, um, 
like that, that's okay, right? Like if that's your, if you, if you go here normally and you roll inside, you're probably steep anyway, but let's assume you're not. If you want to fix this then fix just this and then figure out how to fix the steep part after that, you, you, you shouldn't necessarily be too vertical. Depends on what you mean. Um, Kevin, it depends what you mean when you say steep, if you're talking shaft steep, swing direction, whatever. But um, if you want to fix your takeaway, you've got to do the opposite counter roll. And then I have to see the rest to see why you're steep from there. Um, that could just be a separate issue. Uh, Jeremy, what's up, buddy? Just sent you an email like five, well, now I guess 25 minutes ago. Um, they say keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome is definition of madness. It is. A lot of madness at our uh, golf schools this year. Everyone watching should join CogornoGolf.com, improve their game, and end the insanity. Jeremy, if you don't mind, if you can post up underneath it what you told me happened when you played for the first time in 10 years uh, after you left for your visit here, uh, that, would be, that would be lovely. Yeah, and I agree too, man. I think everyone could hop on there if, if, if JT and I could. Uh, we did add a new coach too. For those of you that haven't been to the schools or know, uh, JT Thomas has become part of our um, Corona Golf team. We marry and JT and Anthony um, as of this past month. And so he'll be working with some of the members on uh, the site with myself and uh, Jeremy's on there. Yeah, if you guys, if man, if I could just see your swing, it just a lot of the confusion would uh, would go away. What do you think of Steve? Uh, I think you mean Elkington's golf swing. Mark, I like Steve Ellington's swing a lot. He, I used to watch a lot of the YouTube videos he's done with, I think, um, like Digging Out of the Dirt or uh, Secrets in the Dirt or something. There used to be a YouTube channel. He did a lot of videos. You know, I think the issue you got to watch with, with players who are good players or older players who didn't have technology to measure things is their interpretation of their feels versus reels. Like inevitably, we'll do a video and someone will say, you know, Jack Nicholas said one thing or Arnold Palmer said one thing or whatever, and I, or Nick Faldo, Johnny Miller, and respectfully – while they're great players, they don't really know what they were actually doing because they didn't have the technology to measure it. Not to say their information or what they say is not valuable. It's just to say Steve Elkington's interpretation of what he does and what he actually does are really two different things. If I wrote a book and there was no video or track man on Eric Gorno's method to play golf and I told you exactly what I did and you watched a swing video of mine, you'd think I'm nuts because I would be doing a completely different stuff than what I'm talking about. And so that's where the measurement parts can come in. So I think with Steve and some of the series they did, uh, the intention is good. The feels are good. I think if you, the literal of what they're talking about might not be one-to-one, -one, um, but um, yeah, he could definitely play a great player. And um, I think he's very good at describing his feels. Again, whether or not those actually happen are, are different ball games. So I video, I mean, video is just the king of the hill. Have I said live you yet? Okay. Uh, Robbie, hit my driver fine and same distance as friends, but lose distance on irons weak and spinning right. 7 hour 150 when friends hitting iron. Any suggestions? Yeah, 100%. Your issue then is dynamic loft. And so if I take this um, 8 iron Callaway Apex Pro forged iron and I hold it up and down, there's a loft, given loft to it. Now, if I lean my shaft towards the target, there's now less loft, okay? Now, if I take this club at the same club head speed and same contact, assuming I have enough speed, I don't know why I just put two up there, but assuming I have enough speed and I take the loft down, the ball is going to go farther. Okay. If you hit your seven iron and eight iron and your club head speeds are the same, which, which, which uh, shot goes farther, your seven iron does, right? P because the loft is lower is the primary factor there. So Robbie, if you're losing distance going high, weak, right, you have too much dynamic loft. Now the question is, why do you have too much dynamic loft and how to fix it? Now, fortunately for you, I could easily answer that. Unfortunately for you, I need to see your swing. That could be your grip is too weak. That could be wrist conditions. That could be shaffling. But if you're hitting your driver good, you know, you might get the driver distance because you hit up on it enough and your angle of attack makes up for the dynamic loft and the spin rates. So there's just too many variables. Um, Robbie, if you check out Corona Golf or post your video up, um, I could, we could tell you in like two seconds as to why, but ultimately you've got to take your dynamic loft down and figure out how to do that. So maybe start by watching some of our dynamic loft videos, shaffling, stuff like that. Remaximizing driver distance into a headwind and improving dispersion better to lower spin loft by hitting up on a high T ball and lower dynamic loft and impact or teeing alone, keeping flight down. Yeah, so I saw the comment you made on the YouTube video about um, learning how to hit up on the ball and de-lofting it, as Marty made it uh, mention in one of the videos. Yeah, and, and if you have enough speed, that would be, um, that's ideal, right? If you can learn to hit up on it, keep the loft neutral, not actually de-lofting it, right? Meaning like if your driver's got, let's say 10 degrees of loft, at impact, you don't have eight, right? So you still will have more loft, and you're also ideally, because you're hitting up on it, will we'll present more loft. Um, but yeah, ideally you would learn how to hit up on it a little bit and have the loft neutralized for the spin rates. 
into the into a headwind would be ideal if you have enough club head speed. Um, if not, you can go teen the ball lower, hit down on a little bit. You'll potentially lose some distance that way. Um, but if your direction is better, then it's just the pro and the con of how much the distance costs you in terms of strokes gained. Uh, but yeah, I would prefer the hit up and deal off if you've got the speed to do it. Not everyone, okay? Like not everyone should have the, so if you're hitting up on it and de-lofting it, you have to have the handle in an appropriate spot. You can't de-loft a tee shot with your handle back. At least I don't think you can, unless you hit low on the face and then you cheat a de-loft. If you want to de-loft, you've got to have your handle forward and you're hitting up. Your left shoulder's working up and back, your pelvis is working forward. Now, if you do that and you've got 75 mile an hour club head speed, you're gonna hit the ball absolutely nowhere. If you've got 75 mile an hour club head speed, you need to throw the loft you need to throw the loft. If you've got more club head speed, then you can do the whole de-loft uh, hit up on a thing. Yes, when you see like Dustin Johnson with the handle forward or some of the pros with the handle forward, the driver, yeah, that's great at 120 miles an hour. You know, like if you've got 80 or 70 and you do that, that ball's going nowhere. You gotta, you gotta throw it a little. Okay, now the counter argument, I'm, I'm stuck on this apparently, I wanna talk about this. The counter argument when people say, well, you shouldn't throw it is that, you know, you're, you're, you lose face control potentially. But you, you, you got a give and take here, right? Like you, you can't, if your clip head speed's low, like sorry, that is what it is unless you improve it, you don't get to have the benefit of the, of the handle forward and wrist conditions to have straight shots and bomb it. Like you just don't have the speed, that is what it is. You, you, you got to find a middle ground between those two. Okay, moving right along. Mark, should the right leg straighten on the backswing before starting the downswing or keep the right knee bent flex consistently? Mark, the right knee should straighten some amount or should lose flex relative to where it began. That does not mean it needs to lock straight. If I start my normal setup position and my trail knee, if you put a line down your kneecap and that's bent basically over the edge of your shoelaces or balls of your feet, during the backswing, the trail leg will lose some amount of flex. As my hip goes up and back, my trail leg will lose a little bit of flex. My right hip gets a little bit higher than my left as my left knee adds flex. That doesn't mean lock straight, but there will lose a little bit of flex. Of the measuring devices I've seen on good ball strikers, I think like 90 plus percent of like, of like PGA Tour guys or pros, whatever, they lose flex or the right leg straightens some amount during their backswing. I've only ever seen like one or two guys increase flex. One of them was Keegan Bradley when he was slicing it off the planet, but he was one of them. I shouldn't say he's a good player, but he was increasing the flex, but most of the time it'll, you'll lose some on the way back, yes. I think the question is how, how much do you do that? What other pieces do you feel in with that, et cetera? You wanna feel the, hip, the right hip turning up and back behind you when you do this as your legs um, losing some of the flex back here like this. Uh, Pete, hi Eric, how do I combine the hip bump forward? You shouldn't hip bump forward, let's start with that. Um, pressure shift in transition, but still keep my head behind the ball. Always need to move my head of the ball when I try. So A, Pete, you shouldn't, I, I get what you're saying, but just to clarify, I don't ever want any of you guys to hip bump. When I, when I hear hip bump, I think this. Like if I'm out dancing and I do a little hip bump check type of thing, that's how I dance when I go out. And I'm like hip bumping somebody. This, this to me is a hip bump, like this. Now what's the issue with that when I do that? I go back this way. Now if you're saying hip bump, like take the whole deal with it this way, um, that to me is more of kind of a shift than a bump, but whatever if you're doing that. Now my head goes forward as I do it. How do I get my head back if I do that? I have to add right side bend, right shoulder closer to my hip. I've got to add right side bend to keep my head centered. In transition, the goal, if you, if you look at my head relative to that, uh, the white thing in the back there, I don't know what that is, paint. If I go up to the top, you see, you see the little piece, you see the little pieces up there by my head. If I take my normal setup and I'm in the middle of that, when I go back during my backswing, I'm keeping my head basically in there. Now during the downswing with an iron, I'm gonna go down and forward of it some amount, okay? And then I'm gonna stay on that line more or less with an iron. With a drive, and we just did this video if you watch our iron versus driver. With a driver, I'm gonna be behind that. I'm gonna go a little bit down and forward, but then I'm gonna actually work back up off that as I hit my driver pattern. How do I get my pressure forward? I wanna feel my left hip down and forward behind me as I'm doing my, um, so I wanna really wanna be rotating, I'm shifting pressure to my left foot, my left hip is working down and back behind me, um, and see my head stays centered because of side bend. If I just went forward from here, and everything went down, and I had no side bend, I would be forward. I get back to center with side bend. So I look like this, no side bend, 
side bend. So you're, you're having a little bit of right shoulder towards your right hip, right hip up higher. We're gonna do some videos on that, that anterior pelvic tilt along with the right hip a little higher as I do my rotation pieces. So I would avoid a bump. Um, you need to have right side bend as you shift pressure as you're rotating to stay center. I don't know if that answered it or was confusing, but that's the answer, right side bend in short. Um, Alfonso, hey again, Eric, what's going on? For driver, Baxin, what is better? A more depth, a more depth arms or more parallel to the target line, parallel to the pec? A back, I'm not sure if I understand what you're saying. For Baxin, is better? A more depth arms or more parallel to the target line, parallel to the pec? Alfonso, if you can ask that a different way, I'm not sure what you mean. I would say with your driver, the goals would be through the right pec, over the right shoulder, having the club more or less down the target line with good width of the trail arm. This would be basically a perfect top of backswing if you can make it work. Um, of course, there's great players here and some here, but th this is about what you're looking for. Um, depth is a big part of swinging up from the inside, being able to um, rotate without tilting too much. There's a lot of benefits to that being able to hit up on the ball, um, but swing length and depth. If you reword that, maybe I can answer that better. Uh, regarding squat and thrust move on the downswing, is it mainly for increasing club head speed and also better accuracy, especially for irons. Yeah, the main deal is club head speed. So the reason you squat and use the ground and turn is for more speed, uh, better compression. So to be able to get the handle more forward, lower the dynamic loft and for face control. So it's really threefold. Um, if I didn't use the ground or rotate as much, I wouldn't have as much speed. So I'd hit it shorter. Also how I get the handle forward. Of course, there's some amount of lead arm abduction, right? My arm's working across me here, away from me. Um, but really how I get the handle forward is more so from the turning component, okay? So if I don't do anything with my arms and hands, but I just turn my body, my handle gets forward. So the handle forward lowers the dynamic loft. And then the ability to rotate and swing on a plane or an arc that's neutral um, gives me better face control for direction. So I'd really say it's a trifecta. It's good for all things. Uh, speed, dynamic loft, uh, which also for distance and then face control. Um, afternoon, love the streams and content. Thank you very much. What are some reasons that newer players struggle with longer irons? I success with my eight iron pitching wedge, but I get in tube seven and feel, and higher, I feel jammed by the club. Yeah, I would say um, all players struggle with longer clubs relative to shorter clubs. And when you're new, things just get exaggerated. Like, you know, if I am new to driving or walking or, or learning a language, et cetera, the same things I, I would struggle with as someone who's more advanced um, like everyone struggles with the same things. It's just more pronounced in the beginning is sort of the idea. So now the reason for that is the clubs are longer and the dynamic loft is lower, right? So the, the loft of the club is lower. Um, and then there's just not as much margin as with a longer club, but there's more mass of the club head. So yeah, I would say that's, that's very much normal. Um, how do you learn how to hit those better? There are some mechanics that go along with that. Like pretty much what I see is players who are too steep and over the top and or have an open face with their irons, really struggle with the longer ones, but can get away with their short irons because you're hitting down enough and the plane works. Um, so I would say typically better players who are a little bit more towards shallow can hit their longer clubs a little bit better. But then also if you have big issues, like if you've got a big early extension issue or a big tilting issue, it sort of rears its head more as you get into the longer clubs. Again, cause the loft is lower and the, and the shafts get, uh, get longer. Um, let's see here. Is the ideal balance point toward the toe? Jeff, are you talking about, um, in terms of the, sh the balance point of the shaft or are we talking like body movements there, Jeff? What do you mean by that? Thanks for the response. Enjoy watching your videos. They've helped me a lot. You are very welcome. How much was the net? Is it worth it? Oh, Mary got it. Okay. Mary, Mary got the net. Mary got the net. Mary brought this net from home and literally she ninja put that up in like two and a half minutes. That skills net. And we've had it here for like six months. I haven't changed it. Uh, this worked really good. I only hit foam balls into it, but Mary claims she hits real balls into it at home and uh, nice. with no issues. No, the balls might not be going fast, but she's hitting them in there. On the backswing, the weight is transferred to the right heels. What happens if the weight's still on the ball of the right foot on the completion of the backswing? You can't turn as much. So what happens if my pressure's too far on my toes? When I make my backswing, the more the pressure stays on the toes, uh, typically the more I'm going to sway this way. Um, and I'm not going to turn as much. So the more the pressure, and you can try this, when you do a backswing, make a, make a backswing turn where you literally put your heel off the ground and go on your toes and try and turn your hips a lot, right? Now, if I 
to lift my left ankle if I can, but I'm going to fall over. It's very hard to turn from there. Now, if I do the opposite, lift my toe up off the ground and make a back turn, that's very easy to turn. Let's, can you put that for a video too? Foot up, uh, hip turn during back swing, foot up. So if I go like that, um, that, it's hard to turn from there. Now, if I get my pressure too far on my right toe and I can't turn, my hands go vertical. So I have no depth during my backswing. If I get into my heel and I can turn, it's a lot easier to get depth on the way back. You can try these things yourself. It's a lot easier to get depth going back. Now, if I'm on my toe and I go too vertical, I got to hit a ball from here. So usually that means I'm going to shallow late and early extend and have a very high handle. If I've got a deep back here, I don't have to really extend to shallow it. I can keep forward bend and start to rotate and hit it good. So it could literally lead to all those things, but the direct thing is lack of backswing turn. That could be a good video. Uh, let's see. Richard, I cannot stop laying off at the peak of my backswing. Any drills to help train against this? Yeah, so it really depends, Richard, on like why it's getting back there. Is it form rotation or is there wrist conditions involved here? Um, it, what's your trail arm look like? If you search, Richard, my name and troubleshooting the top of your backswing or troubleshooting your back, I think it's troubleshooting the top of your backswing. I'll go through these in detail that literally answer your question. Uh, for you, there could be a couple of things. One, it could be you need to, inc maybe you're not turned enough and you're just over here and you need to increase your turn and that'll help you get over this way. Um, for you, that could also be that your lead arm, shoulder and arm rotate too much this way, so elbow away from you. And you might need to feel more left elbow down and keep your, um, your arm more this way. So it could be forearm rotation you need to fix. So just this part, forearm rotation could change it or shoulder rotation could change it. So if I change my shoulder rotation, internal rotation, external rotation of my shoulder, not my forearm, the more I go internal with my shoulder, my elbow points away from me, I get flat. The more I stay external with my shoulder, my elbow stays down, the club goes across the line. Now I can still forearm rotate it flat from there. Okay, it's like if you watch Gigi, he likes a lead arm that's more external, elbow down here, but then you can also form rotate this way, or guys like Kelvin Mia here would like that pattern. Keep the trail arm external like this, and, but then form rotate it and then swing down from, from that pattern compared to this way. So yeah, it could be any of those pieces. I guess if you wanted to overhaul the whole thing and definitely fix it, you'd go lead shoulder more external, which is elbow more down, no form rotation, shaft more vertical. You could also get the trail shoulder more internally rotated. So like flying right elbow, would get it more across the line. Tucked elbow, external would get it more um, um, laid off. Internal would get it more across the line. And then of course you've got wrist conditions along with that. So those would be your options. If you watch that video, I go through all that in, uh, in detail. Just depends on which one of those, um, Richard, you need to put in to be able to fix that. If you cannot, in all caps, fix that, do joint to golf, it's literally $39. Post your swing, I'll tell you specifically which one to do those. You can cancel after a month, okay? Maybe three months, we might change it actually. Mary didn't like that I said that. But you go on there, I'll fix that for you. Just stay on YouTube and I'll be happy. Okay, <laughs> so the uh, nine ball flights, I struggle most with the low fade and good strike. As back in stance and path out to in is hardest to strike, how do you advocate playing it? Yeah, like that. Um, I think the question is why do you struggle with it? And that could be particular to your swing pattern. I have some players who don't struggle with that shot at all. I've got some players who struggle with that. I've got players who hit a high draw really easily and they really have a struggle with a low fade. Why? Because they have a path that's too underplaying to the right. I've got players that can hit a low fade really easily because they're steeper and more vertical, but then they can't hit a high draw to save their life. So um, I'd have to see your swing pattern with it. I don't think it's uncommon for a good player to have a hard time with a low cut, especially if you normally hit a draw pattern. I'd say that's normal, right? Like, like I always use the two iron. Like what's the secret to the two iron downhill over the water to a tuck pin. There ain't one, right? It's just a hard shot. So if you hit a draw pattern, that's just gonna be a hard shot. How do I advocate? I do what you just said. If I wanted to go low, uh, for me to hit a ball lower, the two things I'm looking at are dynamic loft. So I want less dynamic loft to launch a ball lower, and I want more angle of attack. So the more I hit down on a ball, the lower it launches, not hit down to go up. The more down I hit, the lower it launches, and the less loft, the lower it launches. So low fade, I would go ball back, hands forward, pressure forward, okay, it depends on what club we're talking to, low forearm, maybe a little less, ball back, hands forward, pressure forward, I would hit down more on it, and then because I'm trying to hit a fade, I'm really going to exaggerate my swing plane or swing direction more to the left. Now, the caveat is, a little deep plane stuff here, the more you hit down on a ball, 
the more it kicks your path to the right. If you sort of imagine a circle around your body. So the more down you hit for this low shot, you gotta swing even more left. So what I would say for you is to start, ball back, um, hands forward, weight forward, feeling like you're swinging sort of outside and across, but exaggerate the amount you feel like the club is swinging left past impact times like 10 of whatever you're currently doing. So literally it exiting on like a, like way over here. I don't know if you can see this, like way exiting, way low left. Ball back, hands forward, weight forward, over the top, hit down on it and exit way more left than you think and start with there. And then you can adjust release pattern. Uh, Kevin, thanks, you're welcome. Um, got some swear words. Awesome, thank you, Mary. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 130 to 140 for the net. Thanks, we'll hold up though, can you hit driver? I, I don't know about driver in there, dude. But maybe, maybe Mary might maybe, maybe answer that. The right-handed golfer, should I get grip with left hand, then right hand for the entire swing? Yes, I would grip the lead left hand first, then the right hand. Uh, okay. Uh, core scenario, around the green, 15 to 20 yards out on downhill lie using 60 degree. What is my setup and how should I swing? 15 to 20 yards on a downhill lie. Uh, so actually, we did a video on this specifically. Since I don't have downhill in here, I'm going to refer to that. I think we did um, why the pros are so good at chipping is the title of the video, Ryan. Um, again, because you, there, I think it's a 15-minute video that will explain that more than I can in 60 seconds. Mary will put in the comments. And I talk about how to do a downhill lie literally in that exact scenario. So I'm going to skip that. And if you watch that video, that will answer that for you specifically. Uh, Jeremy, third round after our lesson shot in the 70s for the first First time in 10 years, beautiful thing. Unbelievable improvement, truly mirac miraculous. Can't wait to come back and start shooting in the 60s. Love it, absolutely. Shoot for the stars, baby. Thank you for sharing that, Jeremy. Um, and, and congratulations, that's awesome playing. 70s are good. Uh, JJ, how's it going? Good, good, good. I've been kind of pushing the ball in a lot, in a lot lately, not much, but enough. What do you think is good? I've been kind of, kind of pushing the ball in a lot lately. Not much, but enough. What do you think is causing that? So if you're hitting a push to the right, um, we did a video on this today that'll come out in the, in the next couple of weeks so you can um, watch with that. Um, if you're pushing the ball to the right, it's a, it's a swing direction or path issue. So you're too far under plane. Now, that, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a general assumption of seeing your swing. It could literally just be that your ball position is too far back. It could literally just be that you're aiming to the right and you don't see it. So check the simple shit first. Make sure your ball position is good. Underneath left eye, left ear for an eight iron. Not farther back than that. The more back the ball is, the more you hit right. Or And check your aim, putting a line stick down. Assume those two things are good first, and you're pushing it. Then your swing direction, for whatever reason, gets too far under playing here, and then too far to the right pass impact. If that's the case, um, you want to watch how to cure your hook for good. There's three drills in that are good for that. And the follow-through video we did with the practice stations, um, you're going to either put an object back behind you back here, like this, a bucket or the stick through, where you need to be able to swing the club uh, on top of or to the right of this. That looks in my way. I haven't done this in a while. It's funny. I pose this so much, like I actually get so far under playing. So you'd have to put a little bucket here and learn how to swing over the top of that. Let's see if I can do a little half one with that. And just learn how to hit some little ones with that. Or you got to put the object past you. So you have like a stick or the drill in front of you where the stick's like this and you bend it down and you got to swing underneath this stick to the left. Those would be some like simple little checkpoints. Um, if you search those videos on there, you'll see the, the uh, information for that. JJ, I believe, yes. Uh, hey Eric, I can see on video that my club face is very close at the top of my swing as well as in the down. So I struggle a lot with shanks. Could my closed club face be the reason why? It could be, um, but it doesn't guarantee it. Yeah, I'd have to see that one on video. That's so specific. Um, and there just could be too many things. Like in, earlier in this video, if you were here, you watched back, someone asked about why do I hit shanks? And I kind of threw a bunch of different options at you. There could be several things. Could your club face be super closed? And then because it's closed and you need to hit a ball straight at a target, your brain knows the only way to get it to the target is to swing pretty far under planer from inside. And then you get too far inside out and hit it off the heel, 100%. Or leading to some other compensation, absolutely. But I would need to see to say for sure. Like I, I, that, that's a that's a guess. Um, open space, Eric. I'm attempting to shallow the club, but it's causing me to tilt my shoulders up and blade everything. I can't hit a ball anywhere. Help. 
I think the shallow club, but it's causing me to tilt my shoulders and blade everything. So yeah, again, without seeing this thing, let's assume that you have too much tilt um, with, with your lead side going too high. Now this too much tilt, if you have your right shoulder go closer to your left like this, but then make your left hip go lower as you do your downswing, you notice that that levels you out a lot. So if I have my right shoulder close to my hip right side bend and my left hip and left shoulder go high, that's too much tilt. Now, if I keep this right side bend in, I don't change this, but I lower my left side of my hip, you notice how that gets me a lot more centered and less tilted. So um, there's different ways to go about that. I don't know if you're doing that because you're overshallowing the club, perhaps. Maybe it is the tilt piece. What you're looking to do from here is take your left side of your hip here and have it work down and back. So from here up to the top, you want your left hip to work down and back in transition. Take your left shoulder and have it work down and to the left in transition as you shallow that. Those will be the matchups for it. If you search some of the videos, shoulder tilts, um, how the left shoulder works in the swing, um, we've got a bunch of pelvis videos in there as well. But basically you just have to feel the opposite, right? If you're, if you're going too far this too early, you gotta feel, again, left hip kind of down and around and behind you as you turn. So get the left hip back, side of the hip back. We did that drill today that I love so much. Um, so yeah, that's what you gotta do. I'd have to, again, theme of the day, I'd have to see it, to say for sure. Gene, I can't seem to stop cupping my left wrist on the backswing, any tips? Yeah, um, try your right wrist. So if you go back and you cup your uh, left hand this way, and you, and you just can't do this, then you, if my left wrist is cupped, my right wrist, that means it's pretty flat. And so if I take my right wrist and I focus on bending that back, now that flattens out my left wrist. So here's a cupped left wrist with a flat right wrist. So I'm gonna feel like on my way back, uh, we did a video called how the right hand works in the backswing or right hand backswing search, it'll go over this. You wanna feel your palm more towards the ground and kind of away from the camera, so, or, or towards the camera, away from the target. So your trail hand, you'd go kind of here, like a little kind of paintbrush deal, and then get your palm away from you at the camera and then match that with your left hand. You can't cup it and have your right hand like this. Literally, like I can't grip the club. So for me to get my left hand to match my right hand, it's got to flex a little bit like that. That's a cool visual. We should have done that in the video. Um, uh, let's see, Eric, what's up, buddy? Uh, could you show me your stock shipping setup in motion that you showed me in person? I seem to have lost the feel for it. Shot my first even par around after you showed it to me. Thanks. Awesome, dude. Love that. Yeah. So number one, Eric, if you search my name in chipping um, beyond this video of this minute, we have three or four chipping videos. Um, in two of them, I think we go over all the stock chipping pieces. Uh, I think the videos chip like the pros. Okay. Mary put the link in there. So, so you'll have that in there. What I'm looking for, for stock chipping setup um, in a brief amount, because that's a good video for that. When I take my normal setup position, I want the golf ball inside the right heel. Heels are very close together. Front foot's flared a little bit. Just a little bit of shaft lean, hands inside left thigh. Again, we can change ball position based on trajectory. I'd like to see the um, spine and the shoulders pretty level. There could be a little bit of tilt, but I want this to be as level as possible. The sternum location should be just in front of the golf ball. So my shoulders are gonna be slightly open, chest slightly forward of the golf ball. So that this will be my stock chipping. I don't want to have a lot of tilt, right shoulder lower. I don't wanna aim to the right. I wanna have my ball there, chest slightly forward, minimal shaft lean, shoulders pretty darn level. When I go back, I'd like to keep the club basically right on plane where the club head kind of gets right in line with my hands. I'd like to keep the face pretty neutral, not overly tilted down, prefer to be pretty neutral so you have some bounce. And then as I release into my follow through, again, depending upon some other variables, as I start to work back, depends on how much hinge you have, but let's say a normal amount of hinge. As I work into my follow through, I'd like your arms to be softer and more bent a little bit closer to you. I can go more this way if I wanna go low, this would be neutral this would be high, right? So if you watch that video, it'll go through that, Eric, in more uh, specific detail. Okay, Mary put the link on there, thank you. Can you go over that cut driver shot to uh, go to shot from your course log the other week? Yeah, so the cut shot, um, a stupid cut, uh, with the driver is, for me, is a couple of things that I do to hit that. So I don't have a, it's not gonna be teed up, but let's say we have a ball here. If I'm hitting a cut shot, one, I will open my feet line. And I don't mean just flare my foot. I mean, I will literally pull my foot back so to open my stance line. Now, when I do it, I like to keep the hands inside my left thigh 
and I keep the face pointed basically at the target. So in reality, when I do it, the face may be slightly left of the target line, but for me, my feet feel like they're open about 30 degrees. I mean, they're pretty far open. My face stays here, my handle stays slightly forward. When I make my backswing, I don't change anything for me, obviously, because my feet are open. I'm not gonna get as turned or as deep here. What I'm focusing on past impact is I'm feeling the club on a little bit of a steeper plane, and I'm feeling like I'm really exiting low left. Like, I feel like the club exits really low left. I don't feel like I hold on to it really, but I'm definitely not like letting the club release. So from this side, same things. My feet feel really, like if I'm trying to hit a ball down the middle, I feel like my feet are in the left rough. That's how open it is. Ball position is pretty darn forward. Again, it looks a little like if I was square, here's my ball. So just because my feet are open, it looks more forward, but it's really the same. Hand stays inside left thigh, faces at the target. Normal backswing for me, really low left pass impact um, is what I'm feeling. Again, I don't know that I feel like I'm holding the face on, but I'm definitely not allowing the face to like rotate over this way. I'm kind of feeling like it's more, I guess, a little whatever, but it's more so the swing direction for me. And I can hit that fade dude where like, I don't hit it left at all. When we go out, we did the vlog today and I'm trying all kinds of different swing stuff. We just did seven videos. It can get a little ugly, but when I just try and do that fade like that, it's a really good go-to shot. Uh, Albert, what if you're an older person have less flexibility to get all the way back to create more club head speed? Then, um, you know, you, you potentially want to put some pieces in to help backswing turn in depth. Albert, if you watch best swing for senior golfers, I go through about five or six different options um, in that video. You can have your stance line more to the right, flare your trail foot, increase pelvis turn on the way back, have the hand path work more in um, those and some other things in that video. We also have a senior master class, but if you watch that senior um, video on YouTube, you, you'll be able to see uh, uh, several ways for there. You know, my, the premise of that was like, hey, if you had to pick backswing turn or follow through turn and you're a senior golfer, I want you to get turned back. Even if you don't turn a ton on the way through, we can still get the swing direction a little bit to the right, get a draw kind of hook pattern going and increase the distance. Make sure you hit up on the ball enough. If you don't turn back and you just turn on the way through, it's really hard to get the club on. You're going to be steep usually, and then you're going to hit more down on your driver, hit it shorter. So, you know, I, some people kind of give me flack about that of, hey, you're going to turn back and not turn through. You're going to early extend whatever. I'm like, yeah, you might have some of that. But with your driver, if you're old, you have enough speed, you want to hit up on that and because you need the distance at that point, maybe even more than you need the direction. And if you don't turn back and you turn good through, you're not going to do that. Um, okay, Chris, can you clarify shoulder elevation versus turn versus arm elevation? So if you give me kind of specifically in what point of your swing, so there's going to be shoulder elevation that your, your shoulders can protract and retract, right? There's going to be compression, depression. Your shoulder can go up or down in this fashion. A turn is going to be a turn um, in terms of the shoulders. You have to look at it sort of more so in terms of like the torso in general, um, moving in space, depending upon what sort of system you're using, AMM or gears. Um, but there's going to be a turn um, on the way back, ideally 90 degree turn that's going to be with some left side bend. And then there's going to be arm lift, right? And so uh, when I went back, if I go back during my backswing and I have no lift and pure in, my arm would be down like so. There's got to be lift when I go back, um, probably to the point of about 90 degrees. So if I took my setup position and I was bent over and I put my arm up about 90 degrees as I turn, that would be about the amount of lift. So from here, your arm lifts during the backswing roughly this much. So from here to there. Now, when again, when I do that, and I turn and I tilt, that's about a normal backswing um, um, length. So hopefully that, that answers that question. If you give me specifically what you're looking for in terms of shoulder elevation or what you're looking to get out of that, we can have more specific conversation there. Uh, let's see. I lose my swing for one or two holes during the round. My trail elbow tends to flare out in the backswing and he helps appreciate, I think it might be getting too tense. Yeah, that's a really general tough one to answer, man. Um, why do you lose it for two holes uh, randomly? Maybe you have a negative, like I have number 11 on Bethlehem. I always line up in that tee box, think I'm gonna hit it to the right. That's a mental thing for me. Maybe those two holes happen mid round and your sugar's low, like you need food. Could be lack of hydration. You could be tired. Maybe you physically need to do some things for that. Um, I don't know. There's just so many variables here, like to, 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 to put one thing on it, I have to ask you a lot more questions. Um, in terms of your right elbow flaring, if you wanted to fix that and your shoulder being too internally rotated, and make it more externally rotated. A simple thing you do is take a glove or an object and put it under your uh, right armpit, boom, like this. And then when you make your backswing, keep it under there. 
So when you make your backswing, keep it under there, then your right arm will fly. You can also feel like you actually are externally rotating your arm. So going more this way, um, as you go back, you can feel like your elbow stays more down towards the ground instead of out away. Those would be some options you could fix that. Uh, crispy bacon, I like that. <laughs> Struggling with ugly legs slash early extension thing. Notice that shallowing squatting really helps with that, but right, but now struggling, you make kind of with the ball, any tips? Yeah, so I'd have to see, right? Why are you struggling with contact? I have to see, but uh, we, we did a little video today, a drill that I give you a little sneak peek of. I'm not gonna be able to set it up perfectly because I don't feel like moving my bag around for five minutes because we have uh, five minutes. But an early extension sort of instant fix drill that we haven't done before that's gonna come out in uh, at some point in a couple weeks is if you put your bag behind you or put a wall behind you about and you get the wall about a hand away from your butt, so about this far away, when you make your backswing, you always see people do an early extension where they try and get their butt to touch the wall, but that does not gonna fix it because you need the turn part. So from here, if you put a wall or a bag back here, about a hand behind you, and you start your downswing, you need to get the left side of your hip or your pants seam, so this right here, imagine back here, you need to get this part of your pants, which you definitely should use from face on, to hit that before you get to impact. So put an object, one, this, write this down, dude, it's gonna fix your extension. One hand behind your left butt cheek, have a wall or an object. Make a backswing, stay off the wall. Get your left part of your hip, this pant seam, to hit the wall, not your left butt, your left hip, the side of the left hip, to hit the wall by the time before you get the impact. And that will for sure fix your early extension pattern. Now, if you hit the ball shitty from there, you're doing something else shitty along with that you have to fix. I have to see that to be able to say. Um, but that, a little sneak peek at that drill, it's so good that we'll fix your extension. Been holding, been holding out on that one for a while. Um, lots of similarities to George Gank is not a bad thing. Yeah, love George. I've learned a lot from watching his videos uh, over the past couple of years. Um, Scott, working on shallowing, a good thought at the top of the backswing to start that feel the weight of the club. Yeah, there's several ways, Scott. It depends on uh, why you're not shallow in the first place. Um, from here at the top, of course, ideally, the club's going to shallow. You know, you're know, you going to have good body motions. You're not snanking down the club as much to shallow. In terms of literal arm and hand motions, external rotation of the trail shoulder, so not elbow down, not adduction of the lead arm on, the, on that plane, not down with the elbow, but in with the elbow. So externally rotating your elbows or getting your right elbow closer to your left in transition. You see how that will shallow the shaft. You could shallow the shaft with lead wrist flexion. Okay, I can, uh, so un I, can, I can unhinge and or lead wrist flexion shallow the shaft. I can externally rotate my arm shallow the shaft. I can pivot shallow the shaft. I can trail arm supination shallow the shaft. I can lead arm uh, pronation shallow the shaft. I can lead shoulder internally rotate shallow the shaft. So there's options, okay? I can, again, lead shoulder, trail shoulder, trail forearm, lead forearm, wrist conditions. I can increase extension in my right wrist. So a slow, how do I do this? Left shoulder internally rotated is one option. Right shoulder externally rotated is an option. Lead wrist flexion is an option. Trail wrist extension is an option. Lead wrist supination is an option. Trail wrist, I'm sorry, lead wrist pronation is an option. Trail wrist supination is an option. Or a good pivot. That was a master class in two minutes. Some people say you should shallow the club with your arms and hands. Other people say you can't shallow the club with your arms and hands, you do it with body. I've seen both work well. We have a shallow your downstream master class where we go through that. And um, yeah, what was that? I can generally hit positions when observing, slowly mirror, et cetera, but lose them when hitting a ball at full speed. Yeah, everyone has that same problem, dude. How does live view have an advantage over video at full speed? Yeah, no, it doesn't. Like what you're explaining is normal process. Uh, and if you, if you can't do it at full speed, then you're not ready for full speed and or you didn't exaggerate the movement enough. So if you can make a motion at 50% speed and you can't at full speed, that's like, I know A, B, C, D, but I can't put a paragraph together. Yeah, you're not ready for a paragraph. You need A, F, G, H, I, J, K, or you need to exaggerate more. If you're doing a backswing motion and you feel, I'm just making shit up here. Let's say you're too flat and you wanna feel perfect. So you feel like the shaft's very vertical and you go, hey, the shaft's super vertical and that gets me perfect. And then I go full speed, I feel that same amount of vertical is not gonna get it done. As you add more speed, you need to exaggerate more. For example, let's say the shaft vertical. Let's say, here's me normal. 
I'm feeling an eight out of 10 exaggeration. Like the, I feel like the shaft's like this, and that gets me perfect. When I add speed, I gotta feel an 800 out of 10 exaggeration. It's gonna feel like the shaft is probably even this way for me to get perfect. So you have to add exaggeration and or time to the element. Everyone, Tiger Woods, Jack Nicholas fights that same thing. Dave, probably a stupid question. Okay. Do you strengthen or weaken a grip by rotating the club and then gripping it? Or do you just turn your hands right and left? You turn your hands, don't rotate the club. Not a stupid question. It's actually a good question. Uh, you don't turn the club, you rotate your hands. Now, if you want to hit a flop shot and open the face, then you open the face first. Or a bunker shot, open the face first, then grip it. If you're trying to strengthen your grip, keep the face the same. You can even hold it with your right hand in front of you, then grip it. Uh, thanks. You're welcome. Any tips to stop yips and chipping and putting? Um, yeah, ton of them, but not in two seconds. So maybe next week, ask that. Um, yeah, and or I'd have to see that. Tips for excessively sliding in the downswing. Search my name and fix your slide. Um, I got a lot of tips for that um, BM. I could do a ton of that. Again, we just hit our hour. So if you come back next week and ask, we'll go through that same thing. Uh, thank you guys again for coming back Monday. Again, if I said anything about watching your swing video, um, check out coronagolf.com. We don't have any master classes at the moment, but we have all of our other master classes. But if you want me to check out your swing and clarify any of these things, it's 39 bucks a month with a premium membership. Um, you go on there, post your videos up, and we uh, will help you for that. So hope all is well. We'll see you guys next Monday.